Shalom, and welcome to the Code Searcher. Today I want to talk to you about ten virgins. One of the most popular parables of the Bible, and of course I'm talking about the ten virgins of Matthew 25. Um, and the reason why I'm doing this is because um, there was a discussion, and I know this is very touchy for some people, and it should not be that way. If you get angry at the results of what you see in this video, there, you should examine what is really going on there. But what I want to show you is a practical way to reconcile the parables or, or the meanings of some of the scriptures we have. Uh, do you realize there are over 40,000 Christian denominations alone, guys? And the reason for this is because they all disagree on something. Literally, line by line, verse by verse. Um, you may have even seen this yourself in your search for a church where you've bounced around and, and this church may believe one way and this church be, believes a little bit differently and this is why you get you know branches of, of different denominations like the Pentecostals and the Assemblies of God and the Foursquare and so on. There are little sub branches of each one. They all differ from their interpretation. Arguments ensue. And some may even ensue about the what you see in this video. But if you would just take a step back, take a breath, and allow me to show you how you can use the scriptures first to reconcile what is going on, and then use the codes as a witness. As a witness. There should be a way, folks, for you to reconcile any parable in the Bible. Do you know the parables are there for you to solve? Everybody thinks they're right. How do we know who is right? The Father, and I'm, I'm about to show you something really amazing. The Father, the Father has in, enabled us to, to figure this out. You, you do realize it, right? It can be done. First, let's look at the actual scripture we're talking about. Matthew 25, the famous parable of the ten virgins. We're talking about twelve lines. And uh, <laughs> what's really important to understand is the idiom that we're talking about here. This is a Jewish uh, marriage. Excuse me. Um, there are brides, there are maidens, and there is a bridegroom. Okay. In ancient times, the groom sometimes married more, more than one wife. All right. So here we have the story of the, uh, uh, or the parable of this with Yeshua okay this is compared to the the kingdom as it starts out on line one verse one the reign of the heavens shall be compared to ten virgins or ten maidens who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom okay so let's examine that the kingdom of heaven okay that's what the reign of heavens is the kingdom of heaven shall be compared to ten maidens. We're given the, the number ten. They have lamps. Not only do they have lamps, but they also have vessels that contain oil, or can contain oil, as you'll see in just a moment. The next line says, five of them were wise, five were foolish. And this is what we will see, the, the object of, or the outcome of this parable is that there are five foolish. Okay, keep that in mind. Those who were foolish, having taken their lamps, but took no oil with them. Okay, now here's a, another um, item. We have oil. So we have containers and we have oil. Now one of the misnomers to a lot of believers today is that the oil is the Holy Spirit. Most commonly believed. And the reason for that is interpretation from men along the line. But I submit to you that is wrong. And here's why I say that. I suggest that it is the lamps that is the Holy Spirit. Okay? The oil is something else. Can we explore what the oil is, please? Would you allow me to show you how you can use the scriptures and the encoded scriptures to reconcile um, any given parable. All right. Next line. 
but the wise took oil in their containers. Okay? So we have wisdom and oil and filled the containers. The lamps, on the other hand, represent the Holy Spirit, folks. So all ten have the Holy Spirit. They just don't have enough oil. All right? So here it goes on to say, now, while the bridegroom took time, they slumbered and slept. And at the midnight cry was heard, See, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. This is the common uh, Jewish tradition. The bride would come to get, the bridegroom would come to get his bride after he's prepared a place for her or them in this case. And it would be at midnight, and he, they would hear him coming. And they would go out to meet. And all those maidens rose up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, okay, here's, the, we're talking about foolish. There's a foolishness in here. Something um, to do with unwise choices, right? Give us of your oil because our lamps are going out. All right, so their lamps shined. They had the Holy Spirit. You see where I'm going? The lamps represent the Holy Spirit, but the oil was lacking. There was It was running out, okay? But the wise answered saying, no, indeed, there should not, there would not be enough for us and you indeed, instead, go to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready Here's the key. Who were ready went in with him into the wedding feast, and the door was shut. And later the maidens also came, saying, Master, Master, open for us. But he answering said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. So there's an intimacy issue here. They were missing at the appointed time, folks. <clears throat> do you get that? They were not there. The foolishness of these five virgins was that they thought that they could buy the oil at the last moment, at the, at the end. And therefore, they were not ready when the, when the bridegroom came. They missed their appointed time. Okay. Now, how can we reconcile what this means? Well, I, you can go back to the Tanakh and to a book called the Song of Solomon, where the story of the bride and bridegroom is some of you may not know that but it is in your scriptures the answer to this parable and let me show you where it is the song of song which is solomon's and verse 2 of chapter 1 says let him kiss me with his kisses of his mouth for your loves love better than wine here's the answer right here folks your fragrance your oil, for fragrance, your oils are good. Your name is the oil pour forth. Now, here we are with the subject matter of bridegroom and, and maidens. And the maidens are saying, they are declaring to you in your scriptures, folks, what the oil is. And it says, your name is the oil poured forth. Therefore, the maidens love you. Now, here's, here's another uh, um, indication that this is correct in interpreting this because here's what it says in verse 4. The intimacy of knowing this name, right? Your name is the oil. Draw me. We run after you. The sovereign or the king has brought me into his, what? His inner rooms. Another translation of that in King James would be into his chambers. And that's exactly what happens in uh, Matthew 25. The maidens go into the chambers. They are intimate with the um, the bridegroom. And there's others left out. Right? Now, that's... Some will say, well, well, okay. Um, it does say that. Show me another scripture. Well, there's no, there's nothing in uh, in hermeneutics 
good hermeneutics or, or good use of interpretive uh, measure to interpret the Bible. Some use part as, part as if you, if you recall, um, would be the Parshat, um, you know, the Ramez, the Drash, and the Sod, different levels of interpretation. But if you use the scriptures to interpret scriptures, okay, uh, exegesis, isogesis. Many times there are people that get caught up in what their theologians, uh, their, their pastors have given their theory on. But if you use the scripture to interpret the scripture, you, you come up with, with a different outcome. The scripture says, your name is the oil poured forth. Now, can we get another witness? <clears throat> Let me take you to another witness. And this is what we're looking at here. Folks, this is the practical application to Bible codes. You can reconcile <laughs> the scriptures. Did you hear what I said? There is an application to this, this mathematical <laughs> and scientific method, folks, of testing. All right, I'm coming out with a new book, 20 Reasons Why Michael Heisner is Wrong About the Bible Codes. Be looking for that. The access term here, and it's very significant, folks. It only appears twice. This is 10 letters, key number, 10. And it says, my name is the oil. Now, the author of this, showing possess possessiveness, my name. The again, the father put this in his word, folks, in his scriptures. He encoded this, and it says, my name is the oil. I would encourage you to go check that. Those that are, are using the Hebrew letters, that's exactly what it says. Now, all the highlighted that you see here are things that just stand out, and this is the other level of uh, the contextual uh, access term. In other words, the triangulation of, of this table, access term versus that are related in context. In other words, the verses that run through there in their natural form, in the plain text, has one context. But when you see it in the matrix, the Father has put this matrix here. All these chapters and verses that run through here, He designed that. So He says to you what it says to you here today in this table. Look at some of the words here. We can find the virgin right there. Not only that, but restore. Restore is very important. There's an also the, the three letters, uh, Hashub, which is actually in the scriptures. I think it's in Isaiah where it says, who will say restore concerning the name, actually. And that word is Hashub. Um, the codes is down here. You can see the codes. It's five letters. And that is exactly what we use today for modern, uh, the modern use of Bible codes. It's Kodim. Look at this right here. Now, this is a significant vertical anomaly. Again, those of you who use Hebrew letters, I would encourage you to go look and, and check this for yourself to verify that it actually says, uh, in the parable, there's life. In the parable, there's chai, the life. And uh, that's kind of cool because that chai, which is life in Hebrew, chai, is also in line, you, if you see those two letters, Right after that, that's uh, chesed, which is mercy. You got life and mercy to come together. Very interesting. Uh, those those four, say seven, excuse me, it is seven occurrences that go across uh, of uh, his mercy endures forever. Um, I thought this was interesting that with the, the two letters that represent the, the very basic way of saying the end of days or chetz, chetz, chetz. Is right there with uh, in the day of Zerah, which is uh, the day of distress for the Gentiles. Now he signs it with his, his name Yehovah Zavaot, uh, which is commonly interpreted in most King James versions as uh, the Lord of Hosts. That in Hebrew is Yehovah Zavaot, um, the whole uh, Kadosh unto Yehovah, um, right here, and. Let's go through the verses. I want to take you to the most significant. 
of this all. Now, I have several highlighted because I thought it spoke specifically um, to a people, uh, to a remnant, and to a time. And I believe that time is now. Um, this is the, the verse here, the purple one. Runs right through um, this section. I want to read you this one first because it's the most significant. The other ones are just uh, icing on the cake. Here's what it says. Let him kiss me with his kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Because the savor, uh, savor of thy ointments, thy name is the ointment poured, poured forth. In other words, thy name is the is a very same scripture. Song of Solomon runs right through. So you have a second witness in the actual um, table itself, which is actually the third witness. So you'd have a third witness and a a second witness and a third witness. You have the fact that he says it in a, in a coded version, but then slaps the very chapter and verses of of the Song of Solomon, the actual story of the groom and the bridegroom, right there in the middle of it. And not only that, this is where he tags it. Uh, there's life in in the parable, and indeed the, there is. All the parables that Yeshua gave us contain life. You were meant to figure it out, folks. Do you understand this? They're not put into Bible to confuse you. They were sealed in his word for you to figure this out. It says here, his name is the ointment or the oil poured forth. Therefore, the virgins love thee. Powerful. Let me go to uh, some other more powerful verses and then this is in joel this is time specific folks most of these these prophecies are in here are yet to be fulfilled okay so we're in chapter two of joel toward the end there uh, and it says i will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten and the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm my great army, which I sent among you, and ye shall eat plenty and be satisfied. Look at this. The praise of the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim, that thou dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. Who is that? Those that have the name, folks. You understand the wisdom there? There are five foolish virgins that had the Holy Spirit, because that's represented in the lamp. But they were missing something. You need to get that. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. And that I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. And none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Uh, very next is Zephaniah. Listen, this is very powerful. You need to get a hold of this one. This is Zephaniah. Again, the... the The probability of all of these coming together natural, you know, in this table like this, like they're natural, is insane. They do not come together like this. Only in this table that he has encoded combination lock with these verses. Zephaniah, I want to go back to the first and start with verse one. Woe to her that is filthy and polluted. To the oppressing city, she obeyed not the voice, and uh, she received not correction. These are the five foolish. She trusted not in Yahuwah. She drew not near to her Elo Elohim. Excuse me. Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges in even uh, the, are evening wolves, and they gnaw not the bones until till the morrow. Her, her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary and have done violence to the law. The just who is in the midst thereof, and he will not do iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not. 
but the unjust knoweth no shame. I have cut off the nations, their tower is desolate, and I have made their streets waste, and none passes by. Uh, their cities are destroyed, and there is no man, and there is none inhabited. And I said, Surely, if that would fear me, if that would re receive instruction, again, the foolish virgins, so their dwelling should not be cut off. Whosoever I punished them, but they rose early and corrupted all their doings. Therefore, wait upon me, saith you, who until that day I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, and I pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then will I turn to the people a pure language. Did you understand that? For then will I turn to, a, to the people a pure language, that they may call upon what? The name of Yahuwah, to serve him with one consent, folks. We're talking about his name being the oil. He said, I will return the people to a pure language and they will call upon my name and they will serve me with one consent. <coughs> that is powerful. Very next line. We're in Zechariah, the 12th chapter. And uh, I thought it was interesting because it's yet to happen. In that day, saith you, I will smite every horse in it with astonishment and his rider with madness. And I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah. And I will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength. In Yahuwah, the host of their Elohim. And in that day, I will make the governors of Judah like the, the heath of a fire among the wood. And like the torch of a fire in a sheep, and they shall devour all the people around about, and on the right hand and on the left, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even Jerusalem. And you shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. And in that day shall you defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them in that day shall be as David, and as the house of David shall be as as Yahuwah, the as the angel of Yahuwah before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all nations. Get this, folks, because this is happening right now. I will pour upon the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him, as the one mourneth for his only son. And it shall be in bitterness for him, as the bitterness for his firstborn. You get that? That is part of the second coming. When Yeshua reveals himself to Judah. And they, this is where they, they see that he's been pierced. Uh, it's, it's awesome. Very next one is in Psalms. Here's what it says. Therefore hath Yahuwah recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanliness of my hands in his eyesight. With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful, and with the upright man wilt thou show thyself upright. With the pure thou wilt show thyself pure, and with the forward thou shalt show thyself froward. And thou wilt save the afflicted people, but will bring down the high rocks. For thou, for thou wilt light my candle, and Yahuwah my Elohim will enlighten my darkness. For by thee I have run through, the, through a troop, and by my Elohim, I have leaped over a wall. It's by his power, folks. Another psalm for you, which is in 68. Uh, 
let's look at this. Let, uh, but let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before Yahuwah. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. Look at what it says here. Sing unto Yahuwah and sing praises to his name. Extol him that ride upon the heavens by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. And I do believe the correct translation there is um, Yahuwah. I'm not sure that it's Yah. Um, let's go to the next one. But I just thought, you know, it mentions the name there. Of course, this is the song um, of Solomon. And then down here is in Nehemiah. This is at the Restoration. Um, important time because it's it's uh, it's right about now. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from the strangers and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. And uh, that is what I have for you in this presentation. Now I hope that you can see where I went on this and how I came to my conclusion. Um, about the ten virgins. It's not that ridiculous to see the Father's hand encoded in his book. You know, he did speak to a man through a burning bush. So, again, be looking for the book that I'm going to come out with, The 20 Reasons Why Michael Heisner is wrong about the Bible codes. He recently uh, seen something where he came out of, said the Bible codes were rubbish. Um, I submit that they not. I submit that they have a purpose, and that's to reconcile the word. Folks, if you got something out of this, if you got a blessing out of this, please show your love. Please donate to the ministry. We could really use your help. Um, we're embarking in some new projects, and. Um, some record-breaking code searching. Now, let me just say, nobody else is doing the kind of things we're looking at doing. And you will be the first to see that. Shalom. May Yeshua bless you. We'll see you in the next video.